Private Policy and Support Act 2019, after being introduced in the House on September last year, has finally been passed in the House in the U.S. Congress. The bill concerns major factors on Tibet-related issues and especially on the crucial issue on selecting the next Dalai Lama. Tash Dileh, this is Sakina Bhatt and welcome to In Conversation with Tibet TV. Today, I am honored and delighted to introduce Honorable Si Kyung, Dr. Lufsang Singhi, the President of Central Tibetan Administration. Si Kyung La, it's lovely in every way to have you here. Welcome to our show. Uh, so Si Kyung La, all Tibetans around the world are rejoicing about the fact that yesterday the bill has been passed in the U.S. House. So we know that uh, this has not been an easy journey. In fact, you have been advocating and you have been discussing with the senators to sponsor this act and you have also urged the Tibetans living in the US to lobby the congressmen and the senators to co-sponsor this Tibet Policy and Support Act. So can you tell us a little bit about this? Um, I'm delighted uh, that the, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act 2019 was passed yesterday with overwhelming majority, I think 399 votes, you know. Um, so this shows the great support of American people and American um, Congress uh, for the people of Tibet, and a bipartisan one. So this is a very good, uh, you know, a message to Tibetans inside Tibet also, saying American government and people are with you. Your cause is just, and we will be there for the long time to come till the Tibet issue is resolved. Now, in the bill, the many provisions which was passed in actually there was uh, a Tibetan Policy Act 2002 which was revised, updated and a lot of you know um, other issues are added for example like you mentioned on reincarnation Tibet as a very important environmental issue, issue of city and democracy and uh, you know uh, the situation inside Tibet about opening a consulate in um, U.S. Consulate in Lhasa, and so many other factors, right? So this is a great news. Having said that, um, this is a very positive first outcome. Now we have to go uh, to the U.S. Senate. As you rightly mentioned, I've been lobbying in the Senate uh, for uh, quite some time because House with the Honorable Speaker Nancy Pelosi, you know, and other Democratic uh, House members, uh, we were quite confident that we could get the support. But the Senate is uh, with the Republican Party. So I've been going there and the Office of Tibet uh, in D.C. has been working very hard. Um, and then if you look at the uh, Senate bill, it uh, has around 13 or so sponsors and co-sponsors. And I have met additional five or six, around 20 or so have pledged to support. Normally when you get 20 senators to support, which means the bill has good chance of passing as well. But then now I'm going back uh, in February. Um, then, you know, also maybe I might have to go twice because we were hoping that the Senate will also, uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee will uh, uh, pass it uh, in January, but with the whole impeachment issue and all that, the Senate uh, session is not being held. So I have to go maybe uh, twice, then push it again. And uh, my hope is by June of, you know, 2020, um, we will uh, get the, uh, you know, bill passed and made into law. Because by June, the presidential election in uh, US will heat up with the, both the primary of Democratic and Republican Party will have the nomination candidates. You know. So before that, before the summer recess and the summer election campaign, we, we would like to see. So let's hope it's a very good first step. So there's a second step in the Senate and the president uh, of the US, you know, uh, Honorable Donald Trump has to sign the bill. So you have to lobby the Senate as well as the executive wing. So 
few more steps to go, yeah. Can you once again explain it in a very uh, simple term so that mm. our viewers will understand? Because we know that we have not reached the final goal and mm. there is a process to for the bill to finally turn into a law. First, it has to be introduced in the House and then it has to be passed and now uh, it has to be passed in the Senate. So can you tell us the steps? Um, now, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, because this bill is essentially about, you know, uh, U.S. foreign relations, hence the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has a major say. So the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee have to take up the bill and then they have to vote. And if they pass it, then it comes to the floor of the Senate. The ones it comes to the floor of the Senate, like in the House, you need, you need to get a date. Then there you have, they have to debate and then vote and pass it. Now, but this bill also has provisions on environment, on, you know, um, on visa issues and immigration, um, and also funding. So hence, even though it looks as though, you know, the House passed the bill, but the main responsibility lies with the uh, House and Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But because it has, you know, judiciary related provision on immigration and visas and funding related uh, which goes to appropriation committee environment and related right so the foreign relations committee take the main responsibility but the bill has to consult and seek approval from all other committees so this takes a lot of effort uh, fortunately i met the chairman uh, of the senate foreign relations committee uh, senator john rich uh, and then it so happened that I also knew the staff members who were working on it from Halifax Security Forum. So when I went to Halifax Security Forum in November, they were there too. So, you know, you know ultimately uh, in politics, there's a status and protocol. And ultimately, it's more to do with personal relationship, it's personal touch. Mm -hmm. So if you know someone, uh, they will go extra mile to make things happen. So I'm pretty confident that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will pass it and take it to the uh, floor of the Senate. Now normally if you get 20 senators on board, you have a good chance. But as long as you can get 30 or 40, uh, then if you can get 50 when it comes to the floor, then you know bill is uh, surely going to pass, right? But so far, the senators who we, we have, um, like uh, Senator John Cotton, um, uh, Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham is supposed to be one of the most influential Republican senators. Not just that, he's very close to Donald Trump. Tom Cotton is very close to Donald Trump. And uh, uh, Senator Dan Feinstein, very senior in the Demo uh, Democratic Party. And Patrick Leahy, very senior. So because we have very senior Democrats and also a very senior influential Republicans, uh, as co-sponsors, so the chances are very high. And then, obviously, Senator Rubio, Senator Cardin are key co-sponsors. So, and then this bill comes from the, you know, China Commission. Uh, this is not a bill CTA, you know, uh, sponsored. This is a bill, of course, CTA would like to have it, but it's sponsored by the China Commission, which is formal, uh, you know, entity within the U.S. Congress. So that's very good. So before I forget, so there's a long way to go. So there's a step by step you have to do it. Um, so we've been tracking it for the last six, seven months now, and then lobbying behind the scene, right? So you have to do a lot of lobbying and each staff you meet, each senator. And uh, I also uh, wrote a personal or individual letters to 535 senators and congressmen and uh, Office of Tibet staff members. They went to all the offices and delivered the letter in person. And uh, yes, you're right, we also urge Tibetans, you know, in uh, U.S. to lobby and call and write their congressmen and senators. So all these help uh, push the bill. But again, before I forget, I really want to thank Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Not only she came to support the bill, uh, she mentioned uh, CTA and Sikyong, you know, and Jim McGovern, uh, who is the key co-sponsor of the bill. He also gave a speech on the floor and he mentioned you know, CTA as the legitimate um, representative 
and reflects the aspirations of Tibetans around the world. So both speaker and the main sponsor of the bill, Jimmy Govan, are not just you know, supporting the bill and passing the bill, also adding uh, you know, legitimacy and if not legitimize, acknowledge uh, city as democratic entity and as a great legacy of his solemnness the Dalai Lama. So this is, this is very good. So there's a lot of political element to this here. You have mentioned a lot of positivity regarding this Tibet Policy and Support Act. So we are definitely seeing a possibility. Well, um, you know, I'm always a glass half full kind of person. When I initiate something, I would like to see it, um, that it gets done. Nine years of step by step, the efforts and the lobbying that we have done. So finally, we see some results, you know. And uh, yeah, there are various um, key staffer like Jonathan Stiber, um, Jennifer, uh, Reva, uh, all played a uh, very important role. So there are a lot of people who are working, you know, um, publicly and behind the scenes. So the credit goes to a lot of people. And also ICT and the, the in the month of April, we have Tibet Lobby Day. Mm -hmm. So all this has been, you know, uh, going on. So it's good. So, uh, Sikyongla, can you tell us the importance about this bill, especially for the Tibetan cause? Why is it so important? Very important. Now, in the uh, Tibetan Policy Act of 2002, uh, which was primarily focused on human rights aspect and a political aspect of situation in Tibet, so which is very important. And, you know, uh, it uh, calls for the appointment of a special coordinator on Tibetan issues uh, in the State Department and after that special coordinators were appointed and funding for uh, Tibetans inside Tibet and then you know, funding for I think um, other agencies as well um, and then calls for you know, uh, opening a consulate uh, in Lhasa. Um, but this time we have added more uh, strength uh, to it um, because you know Tibet as environmental point of view as Tibet as a third pole is very important um, and then reincarnation religious freedom is very important in coming years right already and in coming years and politically also uh, to specifically mention CTA you know and to provide funding so these are major uh, political statement you know um, so that way um, so this is, at, you know, at this time when China is increasing its uh, influence all over the world, in many countries they shy away from taking up Tibet issue, right? And then American government, or the American Congress at this time to come out with this kind of a bill is very, very important. Sikyongla, speaking on uh, the Chinese interference on the reincarnation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which is no doubt a matter of great concern for all the Tibetan people around the world and for the followers of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. In fact, uh, there was this uh, fourth religious conference held last year in Central Tibetan Administration, which clearly denies the Chinese role in the interference and says that His Holiness the Dalai Lama has a sole authority in his reincarnation. So can you tell us about this interference in the religious matter from the Chinese side? And from the very beginning, you know, when the uh, Chinese army invaded uh, Tibet uh, and then occupied Tibet, first thing they did, did was destroy all the major monasteries. Right? So we all know that uh, all the, not just all actually, you know, 98% of monasteries, 99% monks and nuns were disrobed. We all know that. That clearly shows that the invasion and occupation was also to destroy the Tibetan civilization, you know, so that they can sinicize or make China, make Tibet uh, into a Chinese province and make Tibetans uh, Chinese. And the soul of our identity is also a Buddhist civilization, a Buddhist culture, right? That's what they wanted to do. So since then, they have been. Uh, destroying, demolishing, discouraging Buddhism as we know it. Now on reincarnation, since 2007, they have come out very clearly with documents and directives and regulations saying any reincarnation has to be registered at the district level, state level and the national level 
to be recognized. And uh, now, altogether, they have been 1,300 or so, quote-unquote, recognized Tulkus and Lamas by the Communist Party of China. It's odd. All they did was destroy you know, Buddhism all, all this time, but they're saying now we have the authority to recognize Lamas and Tukus, right? And then on, specifically on reincarnation of His Holiness the Lama, they have been coming out and saying, and uh, making this claim. So I made this argument for quite some time, I think uh, many people know this. First of all, the idea of reincarnation is a Tibetan invention in 13th, 14th century. So we have a complete copyright and patent over it, right? It's an original, our idea. Number two, all this time, the Chinese government criticized and vilified His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Now they're saying, oh, we will select the next Dalai Lama, right? It's so not, uh, not, not going to happen. Third, Mao Zedong himself and the you know, Communist Party generally say that religion is poison, but, but they want to interfere, right? Hence, you know, we have to make a case. Number one, with the separation of church and state, state should interfere, should not interfere in uh, church, and church should not interfere in state. It's, it's a, you know, it's an, uh, a concept or a practice that has been there for centuries. Based on that, what we are saying is, Chinese government should not interfere in religious matters of Tibet. Number two, from human rights point of view, as far as religious freedom is concerned, as far as lamas are concerned and their reincarnations are concerned, is their business, is their freedom to choose the way they want to, which has been going on for seven or eight hundred years in the Tibetan civilization, right? So, specifically, as far as His Holiness Dalai Lama is concerned, his reincarnation is his business, right? He wants to come back. He will come back in the form and the place wherever and whenever he wants to come and no one should interfere. So the Chinese government will definitely try that. But in this bill, clearly says, reincarnation is the business of His Holiness Dalai Lama and Tibetan Buddhist leaders. If Chinese government interferes, there will be sanctions or actions from the U.S. government. Now, U.S. government is not interfering in the reincarnation, okay? Because what they're saying is, this is a matter of religious freedom. American government will not interfere in selecting the Dalai Lama or any reincarnated Lama. What they're saying is, this is a matter of religious freedom. Let them do it. We will not interfere. China should not interfere. No one should interfere. But let Tibetans decide the way they want to. So hence, this is a very... Uh, very important issue, you know. There's already Chinese government is making claims and they're threatening, uh, you know, governments. For example, the Chinese ambassador in India, in Delhi, wrote an opinion piece in a major Indian newspaper uh, with a you know, section on reincarnation, you know. And uh, Indian journalists who went to uh, Beijing and Tibet, they came out all road the same article, the same headlines. China will choose the Dalai Lama. India should not interfere. If you do, there will be consequences. You know, already if China is quote unquote threatening or sending a strong message to India, which is a large country with a huge population and a strong country, what they could be doing or they are already doing to other countries around the world, right? And we, s we saw recently the provision in the, you know, Myanmar-China uh, agreement on Tibet and Nepal, you know, uh, China agreement on Tibet. And then, so all these are, uh, you know, signals that they are pressurizing various governments to buy or support the Chinese government, you know, uh, stand on Tibet in general and, you know, soon reincarnation in particular. Uh, Sikyongla, I have even read uh, somewhere where um, the Chinese authority have mentioned saying that the reincarnation of uh, Dalai Lama has been a centuries old practice following the Chinese law and regulations. We know it's not true, but then why are they doing that? What is their motive? They come out with this, you know, uh, 18th century uh, regulation. But as I said, reincarnation started in 13th and 14th century in Tibet. 
So they just come, they just cannot come, uh, f you know, f three or four hundred years later, regulation and say, you know, uh, we have some right about it, right? And uh, also, uh, the first Dalai Lama to fifth Dalai Lama, right? They were all religious leaders, and fifth Dalai Lama became uh, a political leader in 1642, which is also, uh, you know, 100 to 200 years before the Chinese so called regulation uh, is being imposed, right? So, you know, the reincarnation of Dalai Lama. We've been selecting for centuries. And reincarnated lamas of Tibet, we've been selecting for centuries. And you cannot come with a regulation way later and say, oh, this regulation should prevail over reincarnation. Hence, they have no validity at all. And as I said, they are atheists, Communist Party. They say religion is poison. They vilify his solemnness, the Lama, throughout his life. But now they're saying, oh, you know, we will select the next Dalai Lama. And among the 1,300 you know, quote unquote, recognized lamas, the list the Chinese government has at the moment, excludes His Holiness the Dalai Lama, right? But then they will say, but next time we want to include, you know, so you can't, you can't have both ways, right? If His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the one you want to have reincarnation, then you must be recognized now and accept it. You know, based on middle way approach, his solemn is saying we want genuine autonomy of Tibetan people. Six million Tibetans in Tibet and millions of Buddhists in China are saying we want to see and be blessed by his solemn as Dalai Lama. They should allow that. You don't allow all this, but then they are claiming over reincarnation, right? There's so there's a you know fundamental contradiction itself. Hence, his solemn is, you know, uh, says very lightly, but has a profound message. Mm -hmm. A Communist Party of China really wants to. Uh, participate in the reincarnation practice, then first they must uh, go and select uh, reincarnation of Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and Zhao Enlai, Chinese leaders. Mm -hmm. And you know, they must show their credibility, saying, oh, we have, you know, um, um, practice mm, and we have a tradition of reincarnation process in the Communist Party of China. Hence, we can, you know, thereby, uh, you know, recognize uh, reincarnate lamas, you know. So, so they have no, you know, validity at all. So they have zero credibility as far as reincarnation is concerned. A very senior Tibetan scholar and others have written that through this Communist Party process of reincarnation, reincarnation Lama, that how much money has been made by Communist Party members who are responsible for Tibetan affairs. But it looks like you can bribe your way to be included in the list of the Rinkan Lama, you know. So this will happen. Now there's a different political authority. Uh, communist atheist members are there uh, in the body to recognize Rinkan Lama. And if you want rec uh, recognition or certificate, you know, you pay your way and get the certificate of your Rinkan Lama. But the traditional organic way that we do it, it's, you know, it's a spiritual na nature. Uh, it's a bit mysterious, you know. Um, but that's how we have been doing it and that's how we have been following it, right? And it's also quite democratic. You are recognized and you're enthroned, right? And then you play your role. And if you become a great master, you will have large followings. And if you don't turn out to be a great master, like the previous Rinkan Lama, then your following will also uh, decrease, right? And, and then if you disrobe and, you know, uh, neglect your duties, uh, even the reincarnate process, you know, will be diluted. So it's very democratic and transparent, you know. Now, if you have Communist Party interfering and selecting, giving certificates, and that will uh, be very disruptive and harmful in the long run. So I think all the lamas in Tibet also uh, are getting the message. So hence this bill sends the right message to, you know, Chinese government and to the Tibetan community and especially to the international community. Okay, so the bill also includes a section on democratization of central Tibetan administration and funding for the Tibetans in and outside Tibet. Uh, so what does it mean for the Tibetan freedom struggle? I mean, this is very important because mm -hmm. in the House uh, floor, um, Speaker Nancy Pelosi came and in a way, you know, quoted me by saying, Si Kyung, 
the president of the Central Tibetan Administration uh, said um, that you know the human rights and freedom of the Tibetan people is more important than uh, commercial interests and other things. So quoting me is um, much appreciated, but not important. What is important is that she said, uh, you know, Dr. Lobsan Senge, Sikyong, President of the Central Tibetan Administration, you know, in the floor of the house. I mean, that's a big deal for Central Tibetan Administration and the President uh, or the Sikyong for years to come. And the main co-sponsor, uh, Congressman Jim McGovern, who is a great friend of Tibet, he came out and said, Central Tibetan Administration legitimately represents and reflects the aspirations of Tibetans around the world. For him to say, in the floor of the house, you know, as the main co-sponsor of the bill, which is a great boost and recognition of CTA. And in the bill also, um, there are a couple of provisions on the democratic process, how it started from 1959-60, the parliament, you know, and the election of Sikyong, and the devolution of uh, authority by His Holiness Dalai Lama 2011. All these are, you know, chronically listed, which is a big deal. And because it, this becomes, if this becomes a law, it's a law recognizing the democratization of CTA. Why? China says that democracy can wait. Like you see the protests in Hong Kong, you know, they don't want to give full-fledged democracy. People in Hong Taiwan are also protesting, right? So China is advocating against democ democratization of China. But even though CTA uh, is of an exiled community, a small exiled community, we are showing it to the world that an, even an exiled community can have a democratic system as per the vision of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and participated by Tibetans around the world. Mm -hmm. And today, both the Honorable Speaker and co-sponsor of the bill, you know, mention it officially uh, uh, in the House. So that's a big deal. Now, funding also, you know, we've been working on it for now, I think, seven years or so, right? When uh, Kedor was the representative uh, in the office of Tibet, right? Now, the Nguru Singla is there. We've been working, we've been planning this for a long time. Because when I came in 2011, our funding came from PRM, uh, uh, the office or agency of the uh, State Department, which is Population Migration Refugee, right? So the funding we used to get was up to $3 million. It was anywhere from 2.3 to $3 million, which was discretion in nature, which means you know, at any time one can cut it. That's precisely the reason why we moved our our office, you know, Office of Tibet from New York to DC. We want to go there and, you know, uh, approach the US government directly. And with that effort came the funding, right? So first came $3 million, which is a line item in the budget. Initially, the PRM was discretionary of the administration, but the line item in the budget means once it's in the budget, you, you, you will get the money. And then we increased to $6 million. Now, $9 million. So it's line item in the budget, which is a good thing, because the U.S. budget is passed by the Congress, signed by the President, saying Tibetan community in India and Nepal should be granted this much of amount. And for the uh, resilience, you know, and uh, uh, leadership uh, of, uh, you know, the, the CTA, so which is a big recognition. Now, if this bill passes, becomes a law, now, this law can be revoked only by the Congress again, right? And then hence, I can't say it will be in permanent nature, but it will be long term. As long as there is the act, a law, funding will continue. So it's like step by step. We move our office of Tibet from New York to D.C. And then, then we approach U.S. Congress and government directly. And step by step, you know, budget funding came from line item to line item, 3 million, 6 million, 9 million. Now it's in the bill. So again, it's a recognition or acknowledgement of CTA and his leadership and, uh, you know, a blessing of His Holiness the Dalai Lama that the, if this becomes a lot, the funding will continue for a long time to come. So, uh, Sikyong La, apart from Tibet Policy and Support Act, I would like to ask you a few more other questions. So, 
I wanted to ask you about uh, the 550 vision, um, which is one of the major and important factor of Central Tibetan Administration. So can you just explain to us in uh, very simple terms what this vision is all about? No, 550 it means five years, 50 years, literally. But actually it means short term and long term. Right? And, uh, and you know, this is also based on His Holiness' advice. One should always hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So when I had audience with His Holiness Dalai Lama in 2011, and then, you know, since then I've had like maybe many, many audience, right? So in initially stage, he, you know, he told me, now you're elected, now you're a political leader. Now you must plan as if I'm not there. So as a Tibetan, as a Buddhist who is his follower, uh, like any other uh, Tibetan, I was overwhelmed with emotion when I heard that, right? Now you must plan as if I'm not there. So, you know, for days and weeks and months, you know, I didn't tell anyone, I just could not digest it, I could not share it to anyone. But then you know, each time I went and he kept telling me, hey, you should plan. Then I took it to heart, you know. So psychologically and emo emotionally, I overcame that, what do you call it, you know, that feeling, you know, to plan something, right, beyond him. Was anything coming into your mind then? Uh, yeah, because, you know, when I got elected in 2011, you know, like any other Tibetan, I always thought I'll come and serve His Holiness Dalai Lama. He will tell me what to do and I'll just do it. So you didn't have any plans on your own? Yeah, I mean, of course I had, I had. But generally, whatever I have plans, I'll share with him and he'll advise me. And if he has some plans, he will tell me and I'll just do it. It's very simple, right? Mm. But then he's telling me something very differently, right? He's saying, you must plan as if I'm not there and uh, move forward. You know, and uh, and then you know even sometimes he used to uh, tell me that I worked for the last sixty years, even seventy years inside Tibet, right? I so work so hard to make this refugee community a very successful community, a movement, a global movement. Even though we're such a small uh, number of people, right? And uh, um, and then fr as far as Buddhism is concerned, as far as his vision is concerned, as far as the message of, you know, uh, compassion and, you know, kindness, you know. Uh, it's, it has spread all over the world. Single-handedly he did that, right? And then he told me, uh, now as he ages, as he travels less and less, he will keep listening to news. And, you know, if he keeps hearing good news, uh, which will also make him happy and you know, make him live long. If he keeps hearing bad news, and you know, he will, uh, in, uh, even though he's changed, but in human form, he'll be sad too, right? Uh, so it's a major responsibility that uh, you must plan so that we keep delivering good news to him, or at least avoid the bad news, right? And how should we plan? As per his vision, we have come this far, a very successful, an elder generation worked so hard and delivered this CTA, the Tibetan democratization movement, inside, outside, all over the world. Now you have to plan. So then I said, but I can't say, I can't tell people, you know, uh, this is what His Holiness told me, now we must plan accordingly, right? Then that will overwhelm and make Tibetan people also very emotional about it, that you must plan as though His Holiness is not there. So I then I said, you go 550, you know, what is a short term? What is a long term? So the Tibet Policy Act is also is part of the long term for both inside Tibet and for the Tibetan Freedom Movement. You know, if this bill is passed, funding and the acknowledgement of CTA and the reincarnation, the re environment, Tibet as a political issue will be a law and will continue for a long time, right? So for 50 years, if possible. So similar, then you have to plan. Now, what will be our education policy, right? What will be how we can sustain the Tibetan settlements, you know? At least how we can sustain the Tibetan community in exile in India. And hence, in 2014, the Tibetan Rehabilitation Policy Act was passed, right? So now there is a policy act of the Indian government which recognizes Tibetans in exile and the humanitarian aid and welfare scheme for Tibetan people should be provided for. So this will also help us for the long term, right? Uh, so, health, 
uh, Tibetan Medicare, uh, finance uh, the uh, Kangzhong, you know, the banking system that we are coming up with, you know. All these are long-term plan. Even the backdrop that you see of Kangki, right? So when we first came here, all the buildings look like any other buildings in Meglut Ganj or Lo Dharam Sala, you know. But this is the seat of Tibetan administration and we always talk about Tibetan culture, Tibetan artifacts, Tibetan architecture. And if we can showcase it and say how beautiful it is, this is being destroyed in Tibet. That will resonate with people instead of just words, right? It took us five years to transform the whole of Gangji Kishong from a, you know, ordinary, normal looking building to a, at least, you know, Tibetan design, Tibetan architecture, you know. So it takes a lot of efforts. I mean, you can have vision. Okay, you want to transform Kanki into a Tibetan architecture. Okay. Now all the demolition, the destruction, the construction you have to do. I mean, most of the city staff, including their children, were complaining because how bad the road was, and how dusty it was, how noisy it was. Right? For you have to listen to criticism for five whole years. Then finally, when it comes out in this form, they will say, oh, Kanki looks nice. Kanki has changed a lot. I mean, they'll it's be like, worth it, all the construction. That's true, but you know, appreciation is only 30 seconds or 60 seconds, you know. <laughs> but the efforts you have to put in, you know, plan it, the funding, and daily basis, you have to s see to it that it's as per the quality. So hence, 550 is that for the Tibetan movement too. And the question is, how can we sustain for another 50 years if need be? Now, again, the number one priority is based on the middle way, we must get genuine autonomy for Tibetan people inside Tibet. That's number one priority. Our push and focus is on that. While you do that, how can we sustain for another 50 years, if need be, from education point of view, Tibetan identity, Tibetan culture, Tibetan civilization point of view, politically, internationally, in India, you know. so. So that's what 550 is all about, you know. So how, when, how do we plan? Now, geopolitical lot, you know, a lot of things are happening. China was, you know, China continues to be very strong and, you know, put a lot of pressure on countries like Nepal and Burma, other small countries on the issue of Tibet and other issues. How do we respond to that? There are so many Buddhist countries. How do we get the support? You know, there are so many democratic countries. How do we get the support? And, you know, continents in Africa, Latin America, everywhere, you know. So this is, that's what it is. So how can we sustain ourselves for another 50 years if need be? And then, you know, I just feel, um, I told our Tibetan youth also, uh, on the one hand, the job of securing is very difficult um, because you're running a refugee, you know a community, and wherever you go, you don't have recognition, there's no protocol, everything is, you know, discretionary and informal, things like that. But fortunately, we had His Holiness Dalai Lama shouldering the responsibility for the last 60 years. I still have the privilege, you know, to seek his advice and work on it and, you know, his blessings. Even the Tibetan uh, Policy Act is passed, you know, mainly because His Holiness Dalai Lama has traveled to Washington DC many times and he knows a lot of senators and congressmen and their support because of the goodwill they had, right? Now for the younger generation, the challenges will be um, enormous because His Holiness won't be traveling to Washington DC or European countries. Even if he travels, you know, maybe once, he will travel less and less. Now, to keep the Tibetan freedom movement alive, the younger generation have to shoulder the responsibilities themselves. So that's enormous, you know. So now they have to think, what am I going to do, first of all, myself in like five years and 50 years, right? How am I going to retire, personally? And how am I supposed to support my family in five years and 50 years? And how am I going to contribute to the Tibetan cause in five and 50 years? In 50 years, where you want to see Tibet? Of course, we all want to see basic freedom return, uh, you know, the revive uh, for Tibetans, a genuine autonomy granted in Tibet. We all want to see that. How are you going to do it? So that's what it is, long term and short term. 
We also had quite a number of conferences on mm -hmm. 550 Vision. So uh, can you tell us what have we achieved from these conferences and how is it going to benefit us in the future? On the one hand, as I mentioned, you know, based on 550, we are doing something on our own, having our own banking system, our own Tibet and Medicare transformation of Kanki, uh, Tibet TB now, because Tibet is scattered all over the world. We want to reach out to Tibetans all over, hence we have revamped the website and uh, Tibet TB, you know. Um, and also we, have, we are trying to strengthen uh, offices of Tibet, right, mm -hmm. and basic education policy, you know. All that we are doing on our own. Now, what else do we need to do? hands 550 political was to get all our old friends with political expertise and political knowledge come together and tell us what to do so they have made many recommendations right and then we have 550 resilience where we discussed uh, again have experts and you know both international and organic Tibetans on uh, economy education health and culture right so all the recommendations we have compiled and 550 youth because they are the future there I can, we have compiled and we have distributed, right, since, since May of last year. We have read it on Tibet TV, published in Tibetan and English, and distributed all over, all the recommendations there for people to read, get ideas, and then come with specific projects which they can implement, you know. So this is the brainstorming session. We have done what we could as far as city is concerned. And then with the weekend schools, you know, uh, all over, and with travels more of Kalyuns, and my colleagues all over the world because they are now equal number of Tibetans, you know, outside as well. Those things we're doing on our own. Now, what more can we do? So there we are having brainstorming sessions and all the recommendations are there. Now, people should read it and people should digest it and then contribute. Uh, so that's why we have series of, you know, 550 conferences. Uh, and then also the um, 550, uh, you know, special meeting uh, of Tibetan community leaders from around the world also came. We passed a strong resolution reincarnation as well. So these are the things we are trying to do. Now soon in April we'll have the 550 conference of Tibetan associations abroad, you know, North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, and all. they all will come here because their requirement and their situation are different from the Tibetan settlements in India, Nepal, and Bhutan. So again, we will do that. You know, we start thinking. So just start discussing as to how do we plan moving forward, right? And the Tibetan Buddhist centers uh, will also come. Uh, so that's the plan. Now the Tibetan, uh, the 550 youth forum has been very successful, is in huge demand. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly now, uh, you can see those who don't get selected, right, have views, you know, and then write emails and things like that, which means a huge demand. So we are trying to increase the number of, you know, 550 uh, youth participants this year. And then we provide, you know, airfare and housing, everything. Uh, so which shows, which is good. Now youth are interested, they come, they participate, right? And uh, so these are the things what we are trying to do is now whole community should brainstorm and think, you know, Tibetan association, Tibetan community, Tibetan settlements, Tibetan Buddhist centers, and the political activists all should plan short, long, you know, and hoping for the best, but uh, preparing for the worst. Uh, yes, Sikyongla, recently uh, CTA Central Tibetan Administration has selected five youth ambassadors from the recent 550 conference that was held last year. So. Um, like you mentioned that youths are very important now mm. they are the voice for the tibetan cause um they will be shouldering responsibility for the mm. cause of tibetan future so um can you tell us what are you hoping through these initiatives of selecting these uh, youth ambassadors um we had this plan um, to have youth ambassadors in the very first 550 youth forum but then we didn't because we didn't announce it so we could not select after the conference was concluded, right? So in the second um, uh, youth forum, you know, uh, so we announced it, we selected. it. Idea is that, you know, uh, the youth themselves should take responsibilities. Now, yes, I show up and other elders show up, you know, and participate, we share our views, but there's a generational gap, you know, that we can't uh, connect with them, you know, that easily. So now what we're saying is the youth forum, which is very successful, eventually should be run more or less by themselves. 
we will provide the funding and resources to the extent we can, CTA will do. So the youth ambassador that we have selected, the five of them, their condition is that they should come uh, to India uh, a week or so prior to the youth forum and we will take them to settlements and monasteries and schools and you know educate them as to you know the things that we uh, are there because we realize that most of the youth participants don't know uh, much about CTA and then settlements and things like that Nyamde cooperative things like that so we'll take them educate them first of all and they'll come and moderate the breakout sessions and moderate panels so whenever there's a discussion in the breakout session so there are some informed youth uh, who got outside perspective who didn't know much about Shija and the Mengang things like that but now who can share with them right uh, and then so the discussion is more constructive and productive because in the first uh, five feet youth forum uh, at the end the conclusion was one conclusion was that oh we thought we had all these ideas but later we realized the city is doing most of it you know right and then you know so that that, that was the dilemma and I said why not we have youth ambassadors and these youth ambassadors did first the in the first uh, batch their role will be mainly to play you know uh, in the doing the five foot youth forum but once they go back they have to play you know important role in their community as uh, communities as well and be associated with offices of Tibet um, and then you know coordinate uh, with the youth outreach you know efforts so that's the idea so you know congratulations to these five who got selected and they'll be coming here in April in, I'm sorry in August I think mm -hmm. I think the the next 550 youth forum will be on August 11 to 14 or something like that we increase it by one day there'll be more breakout session and uh, yeah they will have very important role to play it is always held uh, in the month of August yes that's the whole idea mm -hmm. because during summer break before the new semester university starts um, but in Dharamsala it happens to be monsoon season weather will be you know mm, it will be raining like cats and dogs but I think they have had very good experience the feedback has been very good so Sikyongla, this is your second term serving as the president of Central Tibetan Administration. So in these uh, past nine years, how much do you think that you have achieved in terms of goals and plans as the president? The major goal um, is still not achieved. That is to resolve the issue of Tibet. So this has been the main task of any Sikyong and Kashak for the last 60 years. All have tried, you know, their best and I've also done my best and uh, the issue that's not resolved for the last 60 years is not resolved during my time right so uh, that remains uh, unresolved and uh, you know as a Tibetan you would like to see that um, so that this is this unfulfilled uh, um, objective um, uh, that um, and then, yeah, his in his vision is so great and so vast, you know. And he has so many great ideas. Sometimes when you listen to him, you sometimes you wonder, is he, you know, why is he thinking and saying like this? But after months or years, you realize that, you know, he's thinking way ahead. So, you know, some of the things, you know, he said are still not fulfilled. But as you know, I normally don't share much about what his Solonis says you know, personally to me. Other than that, the other the domestic issues, you know, things like that, I think I've achieved uh, yeah, most of it. For example, our budget, our city budget has tripled, you know, I think increased three times. Scholarship increased, right? Uh, funding for almost all the projects has been increased. Um, education was number one priority, has increased a lot. For our literacy rate is 94% which is, I think, highest in whole of South Asia, including India. India is 82%. When we say our past percentage, you know, in class 12 and 10, which is 97, 98, 99%, right? All the uh, state chief ministers, governors, they get shocked. They say, you know, uh, that's more than most of the states in India, you know. Um, 
the transformation of country we have mentioned, right? So on the, the health also, for example, now open gym in most of the Shija, now with this budget, will all the Shijas will have it, a football ground, basketball ground, whatever I wanted to do, you know. Um, you know, that did I didn't promise actually explicitly in 2010 and 11, but things that I wanted to do, I think I've done most of it actually. Uh, um, uh, also, you know, the sweater business now during winter when the weather is warm, they don't sell sweaters. When the weather is cold, they do good business. But to you know, kind of help them also, we have this loan scheme. I think uh, we distribute about 20 plus crores loan for the winter business, summer business, taxi drivers, um, roadside business. So yeah, most of the thing. And then I do the best I can by traveling around the world, creating Tibet Awareness, Tibet Policy Act. Now we recently established the Tibet um, uh, Interest Group in European Parliament. This time, unfortunately, uh, most of our uh, Tibet Interest Group supporters, the European members of Parliament, either retired or few of them didn't win election. We had to like, you know, start all over. Fortunately, we managed to you know, establish and the Office of Tibet Brussels also did a very good job. Uh, things like that. So wherever there are challenges, you know, we s somehow managed uh, to keep the Tibet issue alive. And the Tibet support group in India, we recently had the 60th anniversary of the first Tibet support group in India in Calcutta. Uh, all these things, you know. So, so far, yeah, um, um, you know, I think we have done okay, yeah. So, Sikyongla, finally, do you have any other points or message for the audience? Uh, no, I think this has been a long interview. I think must, my first interview in English. Tibet TV has also transformed, right? Now, we have been English, we have been Hindi, we have been Chinese, we have been, obviously, we have been Tibetan. So, if you're not informed on Tibet issue, well, uh, you know, um, you should pay more attention and read. Um, there are more um, readers on uh, Tibet.net, uh, our website, and Tibet TV is also watched widely. And I hope the younger generation will continue to follow, read what we do, and keep themselves informed. This is very important. Uh, and then, you know, be active. Because as I said, the millennial or the younger generation will have enormous responsibilities moving forward um, because they are better educated, uh, they have better exposure, uh, they have better skills than the older generation. But without his holiness, you know, uh, traveling around the world, um, you, know, you will be doing most of the things yourself. So I'm very hopeful, the fact that when I uh, participate in 550 Youth Forum, I've seen many talented people. So talent is really good. Um, the resources are enormous. Uh, and I do believe, you know, they will do a very good job moving forward, far better than what I have done and what Discussia has done. So I'm very hopeful, uh, but also the challenges are there and wish them all the best. Sikyongla, it was wonderful having you here and I feel so fortunate being the first person to do an interview with you in English on thank Tibet you. TV. And thank you for the elaborate uh, information on mm. the Tibet Policy and Support Act and on 550 Vision. Um, yes, on Tibetan Policy Act and uh, you know, Tibetans in America should lobby their mm. senators more and I'll be there in February if needed again in April, May. So they will keep pushing till it's done. Thank but you. I'm hopeful it will be done. Thank you, Sikyongla. Thank you, Sikyongla. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next episode of In Conversation with Tibet TV.